<laughs> I am very interested in that it ain't over till the fat lady sings. In other words, the situation is serious. We're not dealing with it joke situation. I'm not the fat lady, am I? <laughs> well, can you sing? Nope. Okay, give well it a then, go. then you're not the one, then you're not the fat lady. Yeah. I don't know if you know the expression. It's the end of baseball in, yeah, yeah. in Canada, you know, or in the United States. I don't know it's from Canada. I've, I've heard the expression. It's not over till the fat lady sings. Right. Okay. So it's a serious situation. A lot of people go, it's desperate. It's horrible. Why don't we start with, how do you see it right now? And how do you see yourself right now? <clears throat> I'm in a positive place right now in the fact that I see myself portrayed and viewed very differently to what I have over the last going back through the years the public how the public see me not how the media see me or the politicians or the political elites but how the general public see me I'm in a positive place but a lot of people are saying we're having major things happening and they're all bad so how do you see things and you're somebody who laughs a lot how do you put that together we're in a desperate situation when you say it's not over till the fat lady sings, that reminds me of a time when poppies were being burned in the UK. The poppies are a remembrance symbol, same as yours. Um, and I come home, I was arrested for trying to prevent these radical extremists who are all now in jail for terrorism. I was trying to prevent them. And when I got home, I'd been arrested. And I'd been arrested multiple times in the early years of my activism. And when I got home, my wife's nan was there. And she said, you've been arrested again. I said, yeah. She said, it's too late. I said, what do you mean it's too late? She said, it's too late, you can't stop it. I said, you see that attitude? It's too late. 5% of my country is Islamic. It's not too late, okay? If everyone had that attitude in the 1930s, we'd all be sitting or speaking German. We would have not fought. We would not have won. So that, that attitude, that it's, not, it's too late, it winds me up because it's never too late. And so long as people have got, I'd say that our fight for freedom will always overcome their fight for Sharia. In, in the end, when you wake up the sleeping giant, which so many people talk about when Britain wakes up, when the English people realise and when the British people realise and that fight that we've had throughout our history, when that comes alive, it's going to be something that's going to change the country. And um, I keep saying, what's that moment going to be? And none of us know what that moment's going to be. And none of us can create that moment. But that moment will come. I think it's coming. I think that it will come. And when that moment happens, um, we'll see. I've been saying it for nine years. I, I, if I go back to my early speeches, there's a swing from left to right happening in Europe that you can't stop. That politicians can't stop. And I, I, I will smile and laugh again. The police can't stop it. Islamic money can't stop it. That's happening. If you look at what's happened over the last nine years, you look at the elections in Austria most recently, the elections in Italy, you look at the, the fastest growing political parties in Sweden, in all of these countries, they're the anti-Islam political parties. That's the future. Now, the defining moment, who knows what it will be? If you look at Northern Ireland, the, the conflict with, with British and the Northern Irish, Bloody Sunday was a defining moment in that country's history. Our defining moment will come. None of us know what it will be. But we have to be, we have to, I see my job and you ask if, um, what position I feel. I mean, I'm in a comfortable place in the sense that for nine years there's been a, um, a campaign to slander me, to demonise me, to stigmatise me. And it worked in the early years. But now with our own social media and online media and being our own voice, people are hearing our voice. And I say to people, listen to what I say, not, not to what the media say I say. And um, I gather by the reaction I receive when I travel this country... I receive at times a heroic reception. So I'm in a comfortable place because I know the, the public. It was a bad, in the early days, it's like you love your country and your country hates you back. That's what it felt like. And now, um, it doesn't feel like it. So yeah, I'm in a comfortable place, but the country's in a, in a desperate situation. Okay, right now it's in a desperate situation and yet you're able to laugh, you're able to enjoy yourself. I wanna know, when you started out as a child, would people have said, He's got a great future as an activist. He's going to speak out. But what they, might they have said about you as a kid? As a kid, I was always... So in fact, if I bring this... There's a Luton football hooligan, that was, a football hooligan book that was wrote in the early 2000s when I was a youngster. And the man who wrote the book says in there, 
he names me and he says he's a natural born leader. So, and that was when I was 18 or 17. So he saw that I, and I've always been a leader of the pack, a leader of the group, an organiser. Um, I never saw myself, I've, the, the path my life took, I wouldn't change it now for the world, but I, it's a very different life to what I ever would have led. Yeah, my life, my, <laughs> my life took a, a drastic turn in 2009. It took a lot of drastic turns, actually. When I was 21, it took a drastic turn when I lost my career. All of these things have played a part, but I believe that all of them are tests. And going to prison, I, I wouldn't change that. Um, I believe all of them are part of chiselling out the character of who you are. And I can sit here now and say that I think I've been through a lot and there's nothing I can't go through with, with the experiences, yeah. I was, in fact, wondering be a better Prime Minister than Theresa May. Is that something you might aspire to? I laugh at when people, I have to, not laugh, I just, when people say to me, oh, Tommy Robinson for Prime Minister, I think, <laughs> you don't know, you obviously, because I, I think of my background and my life and what's brought me here and, and generally who I am and Prime Ministers, <laughs> it does, I find it funny, you yeah. this. Uh, but other people see that and I think that, um, I think that, in drastic times, which is what we're in, anything is possible. And I think that the British public are fed up of politicians. I think the American public were, which is why Donald Trump was elected. Uh, people want something different. Whether they want Tommy Robinson uh, is a different story. But I think that the difference is, this is the, 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 the difference is which people relate with. With politicians, most politicians come from a different background, a different class, a different education. They've had a privileged life. And they don't hold the community feeling that we hold. Now, I'll, I'll, I'll explain that. There was a young man who was doing a documentary on me. His name was Tom Costello. He got the best grades you could get at Oxford University. He was from a very wealthy, middle-class background. And he spent time with me, a year with me. And when he came to meet me in my estate, where we're from, he sat there in amazement by the end of the night after he experienced it and he said I haven't got this I said what he said the community you all know each other because he had what he's what they've done is he's gone to a privately educated school probably bus to the school he doesn't know anyone in his local community really and then when he's left school he's gone to a university so he, then he's in a different city again then when he's come out of that city he's gone to another city he hasn't got the makeup and the feeling that we have so if a girl's abused in our community if someone's violently attacked we all feel it because we know her mum, her nan, her cousin. We're close. So, and, and we, what's happened is we have our community and then the, the government have brought other people into the country who have then come into our community who are hostile towards us, who are, there's an arrogance, there's a violence, and then we're supposed to just watch our community decay, watch it change, watch people get hurt and attacked and murdered and raped, and we're supposed to not even talk about it and say how, even just saying it didn't used to be like this, even saying that is frowned upon. So yeah, I think that politicians all come from the different class and they don't experience the life experience we've had. The reason why we connect with people, why I've connected with people is because people know that he's from where you're from. I'm, I'm from the same place. I've seen what you've seen. And only when I started the English Defence League and I spoke out, I realised so many people saying, that's happened in my town. That's happened in my town. And so I said that when I go on TV or I've gone on TV and I, and poli and people from the different class have tried to belittle me, then you're not just belittling Tommy Robinson, you're belittling millions of people like me. Millions of people who now see that, see what we say is a voice for them because they're scared and they've seen the same life and the same upbringing. So when I talk about the experiences I've had in Luton, that's not just Tommy Robinson. That's, there's Tommy Robinsons in every town and city. You've talked about some tests or stages and I know I've seen some very early videos of you the man who's talking there the accent is similar but for example you haven't said fuck once <laughs> and I remember then you said it and you said it and you said it so you you're le there's I've so learned. much you've learned no, I've grown up. So, so what have you what have the tests been and how have you changed because you haven't chosen to change your accent at all 
But you've chosen to stop swearing or get. I'm wearing a blazer. You're wearing <laughs> a blazer, but underneath it is a sweatshirt. It's a t-shirt, yeah. A t-shirt, right? It's casual. So what, and you're a leader, but if okay, maybe politics. Could you see yourself also working with somebody in, under somebody else's leadership in politics? So I'd love to see what tests have you done and how have you grown? You didn't when you started talking. You had hardly any awareness of anything. You, I've seen you on television. Your arguments are brilliant. So I'd love to get a sense of this test got me here. This test got me here. So when I first started, I tried to approach Douglas Murray. He was with Robert Spencer. And I went up to him to speak to him and he pretty much told me, this is at the very start, to go away. He was worried by our background. He was worried by whether we were racist. But what, and I, I said, Douglas, we're living in the gut here. We're, li we're seeing all these problems. And he said to me, if you're for real, then remain true to yourself. Always remain true to yourself. Yeah. And, and, he said, and he said, and I thought about it a lot, and, and that's all I've tried to do. I've not changed what I've said once. I've not, when I started off, I, you're right, I swore, I was an angry young man at times as well. Um, I'm 35 years old now. <laughs> I was 25 when I started the English Defence League and I went from working on a building site to six months later leading the biggest street protest movement Europe's seen and I had so many people telling me my shit didn't stink excuse my but I stare to swear word <laughs> but um, I had so many people telling me that and that everything I was doing was great and, and, and I had to take a back seat to look at where I was who I was what I was becoming at times even when I was leading the English Defence League the stress the pressure it turned me into a different person and then it's only coming through all of that. I'd say that, um, yeah, I've grown up. I I swore a lot in the early days because people from working class communities, they swear, we swear. And and it was to, to understand that that would alienate some people. And yeah, and, and what people don't want to hear that. And, I, and I've just said, we held the Day for Freedom event recently in London. And afterwards I'm pulling people saying, you can't swear, you can't swear. Like, when people have swore, there's, there's kids out there. Yeah. But I was the man that would have stood, stood up the year, 10 years ago and been swearing like hell. Um, I've learnt a lot. I've learnt a lot about politics. I've learnt a lot about how the media work. I've learnt a lot about everything. It, it, I feel that I've done an, a complete apprenticeship and I come out of the other end to think that I'm more qualified to talk about these issues than I feel anyone that's telling me from the media class or from the politicians because for example I, I had one interview where I had is it Hofi Common one of the top U, EU people's his speech writer and he was an expert on multiculturalism so I said to him the first thing I said is where are you he said in Brussels I said, okay where are you from he said Exeter you grew up in Exeter Exeter is 99.9% .9 white Christian town but yet here you are talking to me. You're the expert on multiculturalism. I'm from Luton Town, where white English people are a minority. I'm the expert on multiculturalism. I'm not talking about what I've read in books. I'm not talking about, it's like saying to someone, you can go and build a brick wall because you read about how to build a brick wall. No, you can't. You need experience. You need, a, you need to do years and years to learn how to do that. Well, I've done that in my upbringing. And I think I'm more qualified than and this is also why I come out with the argument which the alt-right despise me for and certain people despise me for. Well, I talk about multiculturalism and I talk about the, the, the fact that people say it's failed. I say, no, Islam's failed. That's what I've seen. I'm from a town full of immigrants. Most of my best friends, if you line them up, their parents are St. Lucian, Jamaican, Bulgarian, Italian, Polish, Irish. We are all sons of immigrants in Luton. And we haven't failed. Put us together, we haven't failed. The failing, the Sikhs haven't failed. The Jews haven't failed. The Hindus have not failed to integrate and assimilate into British society. In fact, some of them immigrants are some of the best representatives we have in this country. So what's failed is Islam. And we cowardly people don't want to identify that. So they blame the others. So yeah, I think I went way off topic, which I always no, do. it's totally fine. <laughs> it's totally fine because your second book, your first book was on you. You. So... Of course you know your own autobiography, but the second one you looked outward, I bet there was a lot of learning that went into that book. Did your prison experience tie I in with that learning, or how did you learn all of that? So in 2012, 2012 I was put in prison, and uh, 
for traveling to America illegally. And I was given, I spent 22 weeks on solitary confinement. So 22 weeks in a cell with no, I didn't see anyone at all. 23 and a half hours a day in, locked in a cell. I got out for 30 minutes a day on my own. Didn't see no one, nothing to do. And when I first got to prison, I was sent a Quran by a Muslim outreach organization who sent me a letter saying, Tommy, sent me, it's quite funny, saying, Tommy, um, like, want to help you find Islam? <laughs> and help me, they did. Help me, they did. Because I picked up that book and I spent 22 weeks dissecting it, trying to understand it. It's such a difficult thing to understand. Understanding that something Mohammed said one day was next to something he said 20 years later. Trying to understand the context and trying to put it in and... I, I, I broke it down, I made references, so I started off and I, I thought, let's make a reference to every time it says, do not be friends with Christians or Jews. Let me see. So I started reading it, and it's the first time I dissected it. And as I started reading it, I was like, writing, I was writing the, um, the verses. And before I knew it, I had pages and pages. I'm like, well, now it makes sense. This is the problem. This is why I've watched as every other community is assimilated and integrated in Luton and everyone sits together. This is, it, what made sense straight away is if you walk into the high school I went into, You'd have black people sitting with Indian people, sitting with Chinese people, sitting with white people, all sitting together. In the corner, you'd have six tables of Muslims. And I never understood that. And when I stood, picked up this book, all it's like a jigsaw, all just fitting into place. I was like, now I get it. Now I get it. And the more things I went through, rape, murder, women, oppression, um, I, I realised this book is all about me. It's all about us. It's all about telling them how to treat us. And yeah, so... I, I've done a lot of learning then and to be honest I'm not um, growing up I wasn't a reader I wasn't interested um, yes yeah, so when this since 2009 I haven't stopped reading I haven't stopped trying to understand and I think that most things I have people who come up to me and they talk to me and they argue with me or they want to debate with me and I ask them straight away like they'll be defending Islam I say so what do you know about it what do you know about the Prophet Muhammad? What do you know about his life? I, st I read a book called The Biography of Muhammad by Ibn Ishtaq to understand who he was. What did you do? Nothing. That you know nothing about his life. You know nothing about him. No. What are you? So you're coming up to me to defend something you know nothing about. That is, the, that is, such, that is such ignorance. But yet you're here to call me ignorant. So yeah, I, I think that it's... Um, and what I take satisfaction out of the minute is the fact that people from my background... And in fact, I knew this. But when, I went, when I went into prison... I met prisoners in jail who said who were reciting verses from the Quran because they'd watched my interviews and they were listening and they were learning and some of the people I've met from my background who you would never put as academic in any way and here they are really as working class people the, the great thing the English Defence League done was we politicised the generation of people from our background and Islam is a political ideology so Muslims are brought up in their upbringing to be politicised we're not we don't, as I said, when I started the English Defence League, I didn't know about left wing, right wing. I didn't know anything because I'd never had an interest in politics. And 30 to 40, 30 percent of the people in this country do not vote. That's us because they don't care because we don't understand it. We don't care about it. And we don't we're not we're not rich enough, and not poor enough for it to make it that much of a difference. But that's the best thing now that with Mohammed's Quran is so many people from my background are now arming themselves with, and educating themselves with what it is, with who Muhammad was, with what Islam is, with what... Because so many Muslims are... Um, what i found as well is how many Muslims are naive to the agenda of Islam. Most Muslims like, are just normal normal people who are not versed on the scripture, not versed on... I've, I've, I've spoke to them in interviews and they say, Muhammad did that. And I say, yeah. Like, they don't know. Obviously, they're told the good things. I have a thought here. I wasn't going to ask that, but my own thing is that Islam needs to go because of the ideology. And so basically, Muslims are people, Islam isn't a person, it's an ideology, like communism, communism, liberalism, conservatism, etc. I do not see a space for it. That is my own assessment because of the Quran. Because if you take out all the bad parts... There's nothing left. <laughs> exactly. What do you see Muslims doing? What's, what do you propose? <clears throat> we have to support the ones that want to leave. We have to support the ones that have left. We have to give a voice to the ones that have left so they can give an inspiration and sort of courage for others to leave. So many out there feel that. If, if the apostasy rules were not implemented in Islamic countries, I think they'd leave in their millions tomorrow. That's the problem. The problem are you're not just threatened by death, but also you're ostracized from your entire family and community. So if you love your family, 
do you want to be ostracized and never speak to them again so that's where we have to have encouragement we don't have any there should be government charities set up to help people in a position who want to leave islam but they're not in fact they're actually just attacked by everybody uh, as bigots because they talk out about the religion they've just left because they're the, they're the best people and the most versed to understand what it's like living in that community but they're given no support i think that um yeah we have to be open and honest about islam and stop kidding that four mi- to four million people in this country that muhammad was some sort of positive role model we should be honest about who muhammad was and if we were honest and many muslims understood who he was because many of them don't in fact, I talk to them all the time. Many of them have no idea. They believe he was this great saviour and this peaceful man. If they understood, I, know, I had another, a, a pleasant conversation with a young Muslim the other day in Luton. And he spoke, and he was a very nice young man. Yeah? Clearly a nice man, clearly. And as I was questioning him about his morals and his beliefs, none of them were coming from Islamic on, on, on why he was a good man. But when I said, if you understood who Muhammad was, I've met you, I know you're a nice guy. Yeah? If you understood who he was, you wouldn't be following him. But he didn't, he, when I started asking about him, Muhammad's life, he didn't know nothing. But yeah, he was there to defend Islam because they're brought up to defend Islam without knowing what he's defending. So I think we have to have a, and we have a moral duty to be open and honest about who Muhammad was, about what Islam is and what it's going to do to our country. And if most Muslims could see that and hear that themselves and then question it, because I've actually had many Muslims, I'll give another example. There was a 16-year-old Somalian kid who threatened to murder my children whilst I was handcuffed to a radiator. Now, I tracked him down to find out who he was, and it was all in my local papers. Now, 18 months later, that same Somalian kid, he wasn't arrested, but he sent me a message saying, Tommy, I'm the boy who said I wanted to see you murdered. I spent the last 18 months researching what you're saying. I've left this Islam. I've left Islam. Now, he left Islam because he's listened to what we're saying and he's researching and learning himself. But the politicians aren't creating that atmosphere. They're not allowing this. They're not allowing the education of even Muslims to be to understand the hatred and the agenda, I'd say, of what Islam's going to do. I have a recommendation to you, Tommy. Go I did a nine-minute kids video, Islam, who, what, how, with Miss Weecher. I want you to watch it. Okay. And if you can, I'd like, if you like it, get it out there. Get it to kids. I did it because in Canada, the message kids to larger. kids is, I love Islam. I don't care. And... The fight is usually get Islam out of schools. Mine is no. Uh, Tell them the truth. So yes, yeah, very good. Because because in the UK we have part of the national curriculum is all the children have to visit a mosque. Well, I'd like this video to be shown to all children before they visit the mosque. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because then they come in with it's only nine come minutes. Come with knowledge. It's yeah, great. I'll look it. I'll look okay, it. great. Because because uh, what the point you're making is, which I said about my children that they what like the schools want to take all children to the mosque. Yeah. Well, I don't mind my I don't mind my daughter going to the mosque if you're going to stand up and tell her the truth. Tell her when she because they take them there when they're nine years old. So stand them there and tell them that our prophet, who was 56, married and and and, and had sex with a child your age. Tell them the truth about the prophet. Don't tell them lies, which is what they do. They bring them in and they tell them how great and love and peace. All lies. I don't mind the. It's like if you want to talk about Islam in schools and educate about it, and then again I'll bring you back to. I had the biography of Muhammad out and my daughter walked past and she was seven and she said Muhammad peace be upon him I said what did you say so I don't, I don't talk to my children about politics I want my ch- or religion I want my children to be children they don't need to be listening about all this negative impact on the world and then but, but the school had the school had told her that when you say Muhammad you have to say peace be upon him no you don't why should you show any respect to a man that immoral a murderer a rapist rapist um, uh, so yeah, so I'm I'm all for exactly what you said that the children should be taught, but teach them the truth. My video is aimed at eight year olds, Ooh. so one year younger than yeah. the mosque visit. So the year before they learn about, and then Islam. they can go and ask questions. Exactly. So <laughs> I'd love that. Now I see you've gone further and further. The men who started at 25 didn't know this about Muhammad. Didn't have that reading. Didn't have that knowledge. Didn't have the skill to write that book. Now you've gone all this distance. Mm. 10 years in the future, can you imagine where you might, where just, or where are the green growing edges of your life? I don't think I'll be here. <laughs> in the sense of, um, I don't make plans. So, to be honest, when I first wrote my book, the, my first book, it was wrote in the sense that I was worried and concerned I was going to be killed. And I want my story to have been told by me. I want my children to pick up that book and know why their dad did what he did. And that's when, when I wrote that, 
that's why I wrote it mainly. And I had that in my head. My children, I want them to understand and listen. And um, I didn't expect, and, and, that's a, and I'm being completely honest, to be 2018 sitting here talking. Because I've had six government warnings. Muslim, I went to a court case where Muslims were sentenced to 25 years. They were caught with guns, bombs, IEDs on the way to kill me. I've had multiple violent attacks. And um, so you're asking 10 years' time. I, wouldn't, I don't expect to be here in 10 years' time. I, I expect you to be here in 10 years' time. I hope I am. I, I want to see my children grow old. I want to see the success they make of their lives. So I want to see all the same things every other parent wants to see. But the reality, the reality is if, if, if there's Muslim jihadis in this country, which there are, and that they want to cause, cause an uproar, and they want to really, then I'm the biggest target. I've said things that in their mind are unforgivable about their prophet, that they have to kill me. So I don't look at things, I look deeply at things, and I don't, I think there will be attempts made on my life. Um, and yeah, where could it be in 10 years time? Who knows? I'm currently writing the next stage since my, my book, my first book come out three years ago and I'm, I'm shocked that I could write another book in what's happened in the last three years. And I'm shocked that the narrative hasn't changed. The enemy of the state narrative, the fact the police want to target you, I thought that would all ease up and lessen up when I put it out there for everyone to understand and, and it hasn't. And um, so who knows? When I look what's happened in the last 10 years, when I look at the people who are now contacting me and I'm sitting down with who would have run a mile from me nine years ago, who knows what's going to happen in the next 10 years. But one thing's for sure, um, we'll continue fighting it with a smile on our face. And now for that last question. Yep. I said before we started, I'm interested in why defend Great Britain or why? What are you defending? What are you, why is it worth defending? Why not just let... Islam take over or whatever like you've just even just where we are now this country is the most beautiful country on earth especially when it's sunny you can't beat England when the sun's out it's the one thing we lack but what, why are we fighting I have three beautiful young children who it's my duty it's every father's duty to protect and preserve and hand to them a safe and prosperous Britain if you look and you really re read and watch and look at what previous generations done, that's what that's what really gets you like fifteen-year-old boys pretending they were sixteen, four children pretending they were men, so that they could run and fight and die and have a life expectancy of minutes on beaches, in order to protect and preserve. They wanted to go fight. They weren't they weren't made to go fight. They wanted to go fight. They they were willing to sacrifice their lives like that because they knew they had a duty to uphold the history of this country and protect the future of it. Right now, people are scared to even talk. It's embarrassing what we've become. It's embarrassing the average man we've created. We've created a generation of cowards. And if you look at that, and it's like certain military mottos is it's better to die than be a coward. And, it, and I think it is. It is if you, if you have any respect in being a man or being an Englishman. And when you look at what, what people have gathered before you to protect what you have. The freedoms we enjoy now, even sitting here enjoying it. It's like when you talk about freedom of speech, it's not free, it wasn't free. Generations give their life, so when they fought and they died. They left their children, they kissed them goodbye and they give their life so that you enjoy that freedom. And I, and I think that we have a duty. I have a duty not just as a father, but as an Englishman. And, I, and I've said that, I try, try to explain that to my wife. When she says all these things, like throughout the years, we're trying to say, stop, 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 stop. It's, what about the kids? What about the kids? I said, it's, it's not about my kids. It is about my kids, but it's not just about my kids. It's about a generation of kids. It's about their kids and their kids and their kids. And are we going to hand over to the darkest, the darkest thing on this, on this planet? The, the complete opposite of who we are, which is Islam. The beliefs, what they truth to them is, is wrong to us. it's the complete parallels and um yeah we have a duty and, that, and that's what i'd say i'll just fulfill in a duty as a as a dad and as an english man it's, it's your duty to protect preserve and 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 oppose evil and even if you go through great people in history whether it's martin luther king if you see evil you confront it you oppose it you certainly speak about it and that's all we're doing thank you very much Thank, thank you, Austin. you very much. I want to say a personal thank you to you and to everyone. A personal thank you. Because, do you know what? And this is honest. Do you know the moment I had given up fighting, not given up fighting, but given up that you could resist what was happening? I've been through years of court cases and wrongdoings where things happened that shouldn't have happened. 
and the first time that or the change in moment was when you set up an online an online donation thing and I realized for the first time I've got the support of people and then and then I beat that court case and I beat the court case after it and I beat the court case after it because now and now I sit here comfortable knowing that if I walk down that street and they try to stitch me up or set saying else I know people are going to support me and that was a moment that I didn't know until that moment so yeah thank you to you and to everyone who support me you're welcome very Thanks. welcome I'm very very happy to have been able to like from a friend of yours from to a friend of mine beautiful Val to me exactly and then I sat down and I wrote it and it went viral yeah, it, did. it really touched people and it was great for me it was a moment for me to think shit like because I hadn't had that support I'd had all these things going over the years and I, there was no support really. Mm-hmm. No support. That was, I was like, whoa. And it was a moment for me to think, gee, people are watching. People are, people care. Or well, people care. That's what, that was realising how much people cared. Mm-hmm. And yeah. Should we go get some English fish and chips? Yes. <laughs> so, and. Um-